How are y'all? It's Kyle Whittington, and today we are back at it again with Low Hanging Fruit. I've got my trusty beer here, and I'm going to be taking a sip every time this guy says something that's explicitly wrong. Um, we're going to kind of change things up a little bit. We're going to be, instead of attacking like the the normal like Protestant stuff, this is just like the regular like secular stuff. I don't I don't remember the name of the channel, uh, but it's the title of the video is 15 Secret Secrets the Vatican Doesn't Want You to Know. So yeah, let's get into it. Scandal and controversy has been associated with every religion, but it seems like the tea just keeps spilling from the Vatican. The walls of this powerful city have kept a lot hidden from the world, but some stories still... I love it. I like the, the, the walls uh, of the Vatican keep people out and whatnot. Meanwhile, like St. Peter's Basilica is like wide open that anybody can just, you know, walk through. Worm their way out and wreak havoc around the globe. The Vatican City is an ecclesiastical state famous for being the seat of the Roman Catholic Church. It is an enclave inside Rome and is situated on the west bank of the Tiber River. Now, if you look at a map of Rome, you'd be surprised there's a tiny little country within this extraordinary city. All right, let's speed it's it the up. home of the Holy See and is also the world's smallest entirely independent nation state. The Vatican covers only a meager area of 49 hectares and its total population is 453 people. This formidable historic and spiritual city is as powerful as it is sacred and no one should underestimate the influence that's funny. It's powerful as it is sacred. So it's just like, I, I, you know, whenever you hear from these conspiracy theory types, it's always like, oh, they've got so much power. And it's just like, I wish your conspiracy theory was accurate because this is just, yeah, it's just nonsense. Of the Vatican, despite its incredibly small size and population. For a while now, the world has been suspecting that behind all that extravagance, power and influence, there's something sinister. The Vatican has been sitting on a treasure trove of dark secrets that are slowly beginning to reveal themselves. There have been many unsettling incidents in the nation's past that need to be addressed. Today, we're going to tell you all about the terrifying secrets this splendid and prestigious nation is hiding. So make sure you stick around until the end. Number one, trial of the dead. One of the strangest trials in human history was carried out in the Vatican. It's an incident. Yeah, this one, this one is a... Uh, um... I guess it's kind of a, an awkward scenario that happened, but you know, as, as as Catholics, like we do recognize that the church still is composed of sinners. So you've got some crazy stuff that happened in church history. So like this is kind of kind of yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah, stay tuned, Haley, uh, because uh, you're not far off. Uh, but anyway, let's keep going. Incident that proved how eccentric and petty some religious figures can be. The trial is called Cadaver Synod. It was an ecclesiastical trial conducted by the Basilica of St. John Lateran, and the person who was tried was no ordinary man. It was Pope for... So, I, I don't know if y'all caught that, but, like, he literally said um, it was the Basilica that was trying him, which is just kind of weird because it's just, like, it was the, the building? The building did it? Okay, all right. In the year 897, the Pope Stephen VI, who became Pope after Formosus, proposed the trial. This was an uncertain period in the city's long... Oh, uh, C Synod? Oh, Trust me, it gets worse. I've actually like pre-screened this one, so uh, the, the the pronunciations get worse. In glorious history, a rapid secession in pontiffs occurred during this time. Just between 872 and 996, more than 20 popes were appointed. Pope Formosus had been accused of perjury, illegal accession to papacy, and he was also accused of ruling over two places at one time. But these accusations weren't made when he was the pope. In fact, these came nearly seven months after his death. On orders of Pope Stephen VI, Formosus' body was exhumed from the tomb and was brought to the papal courts and was propped up on a throne. Because dead people could not speak for themselves, a deacon would be appointed to do so for him. As expected, Formosus was deemed guilty, his body was stripped of its papal vestments, and the three fingers of the right hand that Formosus used for blessings were cut off by Stephen himself. The acts of the ordination by the dead pope were also invalidated. His body was then reburied in a graveyard for foreigners. But even that did not satisfy Stephen, who had the body dug up again and then thrown into the Tiber River with weight tied to it. Many believe that this was just revenge that was served cold by Pope Stephen, who was unhappy with Formosus as he invited Arnulf of Carinthia to become emperor and betrayed Lambert of Spolito. Some people later reported that the body of Pope Formosus washed up on the banks of the river, and the Roman population was not happy with this vengeful and downright petty trial, and they turned against Pope Stephen. Soon a public uprising erupted, and Stephen was... Yeah, all of this is just kind of... Uh... I don't know. I just for the sake of the argument or so, I because I, I'm not terribly familiar with this episode of history. It was just like, you know what? All of this sounds about right. I, you know, it's one of those things of like, it's no secret that, you know, some corrupt people have sat in the chair of Peter. So like, it's just kind of. Yeah, whatever. Even was in prison later in the year at 897. He was then strangled to death. Number two, exorcist army. Science and psychology can say whatever they want. The Roman Catholic Church has a mind of its own. Most of Yep, so okay, so let's take a drink there. That's already uh says so like okay, so science and psychology can say whatever they want. Uh, the the church is just going to do whatever they want. 
Um, so that's already saying like, oh, the church is uh, suspicious of uh, exorcisms and whatnot, which is kind of crazy because it's just like anybody who's, I, I mean, I imagine if you, if you're watching this channel, you've probably seen uh, interviews with exorcists before. And, you know, it's, it's a psychological evaluation is part of it because if it's a psychological problem and exorcism's not going to help you, and if it's a demonic problem, then psychological help isn't going to help you. So the end of the day is just to help the person as much as they need. Most of us know exorcisms from horror movies like The Conjuring, but it was in fact a very common ritual performed during the Middle Ages. At that time, people were not aware of psychiatric diseases, nor did they understand the concept of mental well-being. But, but Yeah, but so, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll make a quick point on that because I've heard some Catholics and even some priests uh, deny the reality of demonic possession. I'll get it. I'll, 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 Believe it or not, the tradition is still alive in this age of advanced neuroscience and psychology. The Catholic Church is... Okay, yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I suppose as a secular skeptic, you would just be like, okay, yeah, you know, that that that's nonsense. However, I've, I've heard some Christians make this argument too, although I would like to point out that in Scripture, whenever Jesus comes across, like, somebody that's possessed, he doesn't offer them... Uh, you know what? What? What is the the psychologist couch thing, uh, or whatever? And he doesn't, you know, analyze them, whatever, or give them encouragement. No, he 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 gives them an exorcism. And you know, when it's just like you know, this, you know, this one can only be expelled by you know prayer and fasting or and and stuff like that. So no, like the scripture is pretty explicitly clear that demonic possession is a real thing, and uh, it just didn't happen to go away. Uh, because, you know, uh, some dude who, like, thought everybody wanted to sleep with their mom smoked a bunch of cigars. So, I know, that, that was a stupid straw man, but let's go. Church is an open and adamant supporter and practitioner of exorcisms even today. The former chief exorcist, Father Gabriel Amorth, passed away in 2016, and it's reported that he alone performed around 130,000 exorcisms in his lifetime. Back in 2018, BBC reported that Vatican City welcomed about 250 priests to attend the annual exorcism school. The church actually thinks demonic possessions have markedly increased over the past few years. And Pope Francis... Yeah, it's one of those things, too, of like, like oh, the church says that demonic possessions have uh, increased. Okay, so, you know, it's like, well, we haven't seen it. It's like, well, are you investigating? Like, uh, it, it, it's... You can't just say that, like, oh, this person says that they found this thing and they've been looking for it, so it's ridiculous. But if you've already... If you're already operating off the assumption that, like, this isn't a thing, well, of course you're not going to believe it. So, yeah, yeah himself advised people to seek out exorcists if they were suffering from spiritual disturbances. Some people think Pope Francis performs exorcisms as well. Back in 2013, there was a rumor that he performed one in public on a man in a wheelchair. Exorcisms are considered sensationalized and abusive, but that doesn't stop the church from... Uh, so, okay, that, that claim of, like, it's considered sensationalized and abusive um, says who? Uh, it's not like these people are, like, doing so involuntarily. Um, and it's also not like, you know, these people are like strangling or beating people, you know, slapping them in the face. Yeah, none of that. So like, how is this abusive? From performing them. The popes have carried out many exorcisms in the previous decade. Father Amorth narrated an account of Pope John Paul II, who attempted driving a demon out of a woman. She had been brought to him screaming like a maniac as drool came out of her mouth. The pope was not successful in freeing her from the vile demon, so Father Amorth had to step in and finish the job. <laughs> According to Amorth, these that sounded like sound effects from the Doom video game. Saw the woman walking up the wall as if gravity didn't exist. The church truly doesn't care what the world or even science thinks. They've carried out. So once again, so he he, he levels that accusation again of the 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 church doesn't care what science thinks is like bro where do you think science came from okay because like science like science would have not have been born the only way that science was actually born was you had to have a system that believed in a um uh, in a perfect god oh mea culpa sorry guys uh that was from call of duty uh nazi zombies so uh, I think that kind of just invalidated the rest of my arguments, but anyway, uh, but anyway, it's just like, you had to presuppose that there was a perfect God with perfect rules in order to have science that had also perfect rules that were reproducible because, you know, previous to Christianity, you would just think is like, Oh, why, why are the seas, you know, really rough today? Oh, because Poseidon is angry. Well, okay. Then we, we figured out like, Oh, Poseidon's not real. Oh, there's God who like, is perfect and his rules are perfect and in that system science was born and it's kind of one of those things that like you see atheists 
like try to claim credit for like the invention of science. And it's just like, bro, atheism didn't exist until like the 17th century. And I'm being generous there. So it's just like, and you know, it kind of predates that by quite a bit. So, you know, I don't, I don't understand how you can invent something centuries before you existed. So yeah. But anyway, let's go. Read out hundreds of thousands of exorcisms and plan to carry on with these in the future. Number three, Secrets of Fatima. The sensational story about... Yeah, like I said, the, the, well, I mean, you know, we, as I suppose Fatima is probably closer to like the right way to pronounce it. But, you know, as English speakers, we should just saying Fatima. Three Secrets of Fatima came to light in 1970. These aren't secrets anymore, as the entire world knows about them, but the Vatican still doesn't have much to say about these apocalyptic visions and prophecies. Of these, the third secret has received significantly more attention by the Catholic masses. These secrets... Okay, yeah, so like, one is like, why has the Vatican not been more explicit on this? It's like, well, it's private revelation. Uh, you know, it's not to say that like, uh, you know, it's worthless and, and whatever, but like absolutely none of the faithful are required to believe this. Uh, it, it's not offensive. You can, but if you don't find it convincing either, that's also not bad. Uh, so yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway, he, uh, yeah. These secrets were actually prophecies blessed to three young Portuguese shepherds. It's reported that these were revealed by a Marian apparition who is now called Our Lady of Fatima. Lucia Santos and her cousins Jacinta and Francisco were the three young Portuguese shepherds who reported being visited by the Virgin Mary a total of six times between May and October of 1917. Among them, Lucia was the one who revealed these secrets to everyone when the local bishop advised her to do so. People were not immediately convinced of these as there was no proof. However, in October of 1917, when the final apparition of Fatima occurred, the Virgin Mary performed a sun dance. This was witnessed by everyone present, which included news reporters who wrote many articles about this strange event in the papers. The children... So it's funny because like, he's like the Vatican... Okay, so... You, you can see the title up on the screen now is that these are the secrets that the Vatican doesn't want you to know. Meanwhile, like this is kind of one of those events that we like as Catholics, like we never shut up about. So this is very obviously. And I mean, you know, just what was it? Uh, last year? I don't know. It was. Uh, yeah, it was just last year. Uh, whenever there was the uh, the consecration of Russia that the Pope did, because that was just. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's. How can you say that like the Vatican wants to keep this a secret and doesn't want you to know um, whenever like w it's very, very public, I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She performed a sun dance, uh, which is um, this is. <laughs> yeah. So the sun dance, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure like if y'all are watching this, you're already familiar with the miracle of the sun. Uh, but it wasn't that like, you know, the the Virgin Mary did like this Native American sun dance and I. This is probably what the sun dance looks like. But uh, it's, you know, the sun actually moved and there were people that witnessed it, hence the papers that he referenced. So, yeah, so it's just like there, there's pretty strong evidence that this actually happened. And you can try to reason it away with mass hysteria and whatever. And it's just like, ah, come on now. This is y'all. Y'all are y'all are just you just looking to just discredit this thing because you've already like you started off with not believing it and now you're just trying to prove it so no let's go children were actually supposed to keep these prophecies a secret but after almost 20 years lucia decided to write down the first two secrets she still had doubts about revealing the third one but the bishop convinced her to do so the first secret was somewhat like a vision of hell she then wrote that all three children were blessed with the vision of hell by the virgin mary they saw suffering souls and their condition was so pitiful that they had a hard time looking at them. The second secret was a vision or more like a premonition about the First World War. The children were shown how the war would end, only to be followed by another war. The third secret is the most unsettling, and it wasn't revealed with the first two. In fact, Lucia wrote it down on a piece of paper and placed it inside of a sealed envelope. She then instructed that this was not to be opened before the year 1960. The letter was then opened in 1960, but its contents were only seen by a selective audience and were kept hidden from the public until the year 2000. The third... Yeah, it, and so like, it's like, oh, secret, secret, secret. It's like, well, uh, you know, whenever it comes to like private revelation and stuff like that, there's an element of prudence there because it's just like you don't want people to be so hardcore focused on private revelation that they completely forget about public revelation, namely scripture. So, uh, you know, whenever I um, whenever I talk to whenever I talk to people and they start referencing all these apparitions, one of my first questions to them is, have you gone cover to cover with the Bible yet? And usually the answer is, well, no. And it's just like, OK, before you start diving into all of this private revelation, you need to get the foundation. You need to get the basics under you first. So go cover to cover with the Bible. I recommend commentary. Bible in a year with Father Mike Schmitz is fantastic. Highly recommend it. 
So before y'all start, you know, going down these rabbit holes with private revelation, get the public revelation under your belt first. The third secret is a vision of the 1981 assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II. The prophecy describes the bishop wearing a white dress as he makes his way towards a cross. He's then seen struggling to get to it as corpses of many thousands of martyrs surround him. But after he reaches the cross that's installed on the top of a mountain, he's killed by bullets and arrows. Two angels standing under each arm of the cross are also described. This, however, may not be the entire third secret, as many people believe that all of the contents of this letter from Lucia are not made public, and the Vatican is still keeping it a secret. Yep, so that's just one of those things that I was just like, well, I think you've got more. Okay. What, what, what's your basis for that? Like, it's just general suspicion. Like, do you have a reason? Like, have you seen something that would suggest that there's more? Are you just making things up? And, uh, you know, as we go through this video, like, so far, it's been pretty tame. And as you can see from, like, the freeze frame right here, guess which what... Guess which country's propaganda we're going to be uh, talking about today. So let's go. Number four, Vatican and Nazis. Another one of the Vatican's dirty secrets is their involvement with the Nazis. It's no secret that the Vatican just silently stood by and watched as Hitler and his Nazi army. The Vatican just silently stood by. Okay, uh, movie recommendation. Um, I highly, highly uh, would recommend you guys go watch the movie uh, The Scarlet and the Black with Gregory Peck. Uh, I know my wife's watching right now. It's an older movie. Uh, fantastic. It's a really fun watch. But it it really kind of highlights uh, the Vatican's role in uh, under basically Nazi occupation. You know, the Pope, um, It it's really cool, actually. Uh, so now that things are way down the line, things are becoming declassified and whatnot, uh, the Pope actually had a, uh, a code name with the uh with the allies and i believe his code name was like chief or something like that so if you were talking about oh hey yeah we, we talked to chief he said that he can have people do this that whatever uh yeah so that was pope Pius the 12th that was um that was there to you know shepherd under that now uh many there's been a i can't remember the name of the italian cardinal but uh before he died he was named righteous among the nations which is the highest honor that like the nation of Israel can can bestow upon a Gentile. And it wasn't just this cardinal, like multiple Catholic prelates were given this title of righteous among the nations. And then I, the, the name escapes me, but whenever he was given uh, this title of righteous among the nations, like in his acceptance speech, what he said was, um, I... Uh, all the credit goes to Pope Pius XII because all I was ever doing was acting under his orders. And you know he wasn't trying to like suck up to the Pope or anything because at this point that he was dead. And this guy was already a cardinal. So like there's really only one place to go from there and that's to the papacy. But like, you know, most cardinals aren't going to be Pope. So like, you know, if you want to like say all this stuff, but where does this idea come by that the Vatican was stood by or was complicit with the Nazis? What nation after World War II benefited the most from the Vatican getting a black eye? Maybe this really aggressive atheistic nation that wanted to take over the world. Hmm, the Soviet Union. Hmm. Yeah. So, like, all of this stuff, like, you, if you read the book uh, Bearing False Witness by the late Rodney Stark, he outlines like all the origins of this stuff, and it is just straight up Soviet propaganda. Uh, they just wanted, uh, they just wanted people to think that, like, oh, Vatican bad, lose support of the Vatican because, you know, there was especially this one particular Polish Archbishop was a was a particularly uh, painful thorn in their side. Uh, this guy, little unknown guy named Karol Wojtyla, uh, and yeah, it, it's. You know, and ultimately, like after the fall of the Soviet Union, I, I believe uh, President Ronald Reagan even said, like, you know, we, we're very thankful to Pope John Paul II because uh, he was absolutely instrumental in bringing down the Soviet Union. So the Soviets were right to fear the Vatican. Um, it's just, you know, the Vatican's still here and the Soviet Union is, you know, technically gone. Army committed inhumane crimes and atrocities during the Second World War. They completely disregarded the persecution of Jews under the oppressive regime. But when the second and by uh, completely ignored the persecution of Jews, uh, I, I guess that that takes into con the account like the six over hundred thousand 
Jews that Pope Pius XII harbored. And uh, like, I, I saw this meme once that it was just like the various uh, people that were like sheltering Jews was like, you know, Oscar Schindler was like, uh, was like, oh, hey, what you got there? Uh, and he's just like, uh, forced laborers. And then it goes down to Pope Pius XII. And it was just like, oh, what do you have there? It's 130,000 Jews and you can't have them. So like, yeah, it was a, it was a, it, that this whole, this, this whole narrative uh, completely flies in the face of history. And uh, you know, if you read the Jewish sources and not just the Soviet ones, the Jewish so sources tell a completely different story. When the second world war ended and the Nazis would be defeated, the Vatican also provided thousands of war criminals and Nazi soldiers safe passage. These soldiers fled to South America through passages that are now called the Rat Lines. It was not an entirely organized system, but instead was a kind of collaboration in which multiple institutions took part in helping the Nazis flee and avoid accountability after the war was over. Thousands of Nazis. Uh, there was a, I, I don't know about, um, I don't, I, I, that, so this is one of the things of like why it's incredibly important to get your facts straight. Because the moment that you like get one thing wrong or two things wrong or like 15 things wrong, people are just going to assume that you got the rest of the things wrong too, because I've never heard of this before, but my assumption is that it's false because the, the amount of trust that's been that this, that these people have uh, tried to set up is just gone. Um, so, but there was one instance at the end of the Scarlet and the black where, you know, it was uh, the, the Monsignor that was played by Gregory Peck and the, uh, the Nazi commander who like, those are kind of like the main protagonist antagonist. Um, at the end, he says, like, I know that we've lost the war. I know um, that we are, you know, we're done. Get my family out of here. And uh, and like it, it's a it's a great uh, scene because uh, and I don't want to ruin it too much. But uh, anyway, like he does. He, he like the the Nazi uh, the Nazi general like he stays. He's he gets arrested. But uh, his family does, like his his wife and and children do get smuggled out to some other way. And it was just like the same. And the way that that was done, though, is that they use like the same uh, methods that they were smuggling the Jews out as well. So that's uh, yeah. And then anyway, there's there's some other cool things in there too uh, in that movie. I don't want to spoil it because it's it's definitely worth watching. So the Scarlet and the Black. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go watch it. Thousands of Nazi soldiers would flee Europe with the Catholic Church's help, and some notable names included Franz Stangl, the perpetrator of mass murder in concentration camps, Adolf Eichmann, Joseph Mengel, Klaus Barbie, Walter Ralph, and more. A Harvard researcher named Gerald Steinecker wrote his book that many Red Cross members had a soft corner for the... Okay, so this is hilarious. The Red Cross has nothing to do with the Catholic Church. The Red Cross was founded by Clara Barton, like, around, like, the American Civil War. Clara Barton wasn't Catholic. The, the, the Red Cross has absolutely nothing to do with the Catholic church. So he's just like, Oh, well, here's our, here's our proof here. The red cross had soft. It's just like, okay, cool. We're not talking about the red cross. We're talking about the Catholic church. This is a complete and total non sequitur. So like whoever did this, I promise you, like they were doing it for clicks and not, uh, not for any sort of integrity. Uh, you know, not which, I mean, this is YouTube. So you know what? I guess fair enough. As long as you get your money, uh, it makes it okay. So anyway, let's keep going for the Nazis and they provided them travel documents to escape. The Vatican aided many Nazi fugitives, despite knowing the brutalities committed by them. The documents related to this Nazi saving mission are still hidden in the Vatican archives. However, OK, so the only source that they cited was something that was completely irrelevant to the Catholic Church. And I guess the other source that is cited is the uh, the, you know, the very strong. Just believe me, bro. Researchers are still trying to gain access to these records. No. OK. So uh, we're going to be talking about the Vatican secret archives. Um, but like, first off, they're actually not even called the Vatican secret archives anymore. Uh, they're called the apostolic archives. Um, and it's just like, okay, because the name was a little misleading. Uh, it, you know, the secret archives were, could probably more accurately be called the private archives. So it's like, this is like the private, uh, the private, uh, you know, the, private archives of the Vatican or the Pope. Now, researchers are allowed in there. Uh, I checked the website. You can, you know, you could just like type in Vatican secret archives, access, whatever. They allow 60 researchers in per day. You just have to like fill out a form. And I guess it's just like, they give you a date, like, okay, like you will be allowed to come in here this day. 
So it's not like the the secret archives are are this dark and mysterious force that researchers have been trying to get for years. It's just like no, if you if you're a researcher, fill out the form and they'll get back to you eventually. Now, like just any other government, it's probably not going to be out quickly. Like, you know, if I fill it out today, I'm not getting in tomorrow. It might be months. So, like there's a reason why some of these researchers might not have come in and like looked at this stuff because it's probably not really worth looking at because there's not a lot there. So, hmm. So maybe ask that question is like, why are researchers not looking into this? It's like probably because the free and open source stuff that's are, they're not behind the Vatican, uh, the Vatican walls, uh, tell a pretty comprehensive story already. Anyway. Number five, Rwandan tragedy. Back in 2017, Pope Francis made news by officially offering an apology to the victims of the infamous Rwandan genocide. Okay, so uh, once again, the title of the uh, video is uh, The Vatican Doesn't Want You to Know About It. If the Vatican doesn't want you to know about it, the uh, the Pope would have never apologized. The Pope would have never uh, acknowledged it, whatever. Uh, I'm not familiar, too familiar with this episode of history. Uh, you know, obviously, like I've heard of the Rwandan genocide, so... Okay, cool. So I guess like just for the sake of this, like I can um, go, oh, oh, okay, uh, tragedy, uh, atrocities are committed occasionally by men in the church. This is, the, I mean, it's in scripture, like especially like you go back to like Old Testament, whatever, like, you know, God's people have been known to commit atrocities occasionally. But even then, like, well, you'll see. Despite trying to suppress the secret, the Vatican was unable to avoid accountability for this. It's a known fact that many members of the Catholic Church took part in ethnic cleansing in Rome. So you claim that, like, we are trying to suppress it. What? How, what makes you think that that was the case? Wanda in 1994. Instead of attempting to save the victimized Tutsi ethnic group, the priests, nuns, and other clergy members only made things worse for them. More than 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus were murdered by extremists between April and June of 1994. The Rwandan... Okay, but none of that sounds like it's just like okay extremists okay where it, it, it's one of those things of like okay i know this happened what's the church's involvement spit it out you like you're accusing us of something spit out what the involvement is and president at the time triggered this violence he was a hutu and when his plane would be shot down the national media and the presidential guard began the propaganda against the tutsis citizens and others both killed the poor tutsis and in fact many hutus were forced to kill their tutsi friends and neighbors thousands of them sought refuge in churches but were murdered by the assistance of clergy members Okay, so killed in assistance with uh, clergy members. You know, like, maybe this is true, but, like, it's just, like, one of those things, like, we've already caught you in, like, 20 lies at this point, so, like, is that even true? In August of 1994, around 5,000 people were murdered at one Catholic church, and another priest named Father Athanasi Saramba ordered his church to be bulldozed with 2,000 Tutsi refugees locked inside, and another priest would be... Okay, if that's true, then that's awful. And that priest should absolutely be, be held accountable for that. Um, but like, I don't see why like this would be a, the Vatican doesn't want you to know about it, especially like I said, at the beginning of this section, Pope Francis apologized. So like, you don't apologize for something that you wanted to keep a secret. Would be charged by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda for drafting lists of Tutsi people for the killing. Experts believe the church was partial to the wrong ruling of Hutus and supported them in the genocide. Number six, Satan's spell book. Oh, boy. Amongst the Vatican's hundreds of thousands of secret archives, there is a sinister and downright scary book that they don't want anyone to access. It's okay. Yep, Satan's spell book. Now, I want. I'm gonna. I'm gonna pause just for like two seconds here and just think. Maybe even put it in the comments. Put it in the live chat. Why do you think that the church wouldn't want somebody reading a book titled Satan's Spell Book? Maybe because it's witchcraft and that's like explicitly condemned by scripture multiple times and many times in church history. It's explicitly condemned. So maybe it's not that the Vatican wants the this book to be secret. More like we want all copies burned. Not because we want the, the secret knowledge secret. No, it's, uh, uh, it's because it's bad for you. Oh my goodness. It's considered the most dangerous book of spells in human history. The name of the book is Le Grand Grimoire, and it was written around 50. It, it's considered the most dangerous book in, 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 in history, spell book in history. Like, I, according to who? I mean, it, it's just kind of one of those things of like, 
at that point, we're talking about degrees of heroin. Like, what's the worst kind of heroin for you? It's just like, um, kind of all of it. Um, you know, you, 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 it's, it's general, generally speaking, you want to avoid all of it. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe the stuff from Mexico is, uh, is a little bit more harsh on the body than the stuff in the U S but, uh, yeah. So it's just like, okay. Uh, hmm. On 1520, the author of this frightening book was an apocryphal figure named Honoris of Thebes. Many believe that the man was possessed by Satan. The book is written in biblical Hebrew or Aramaic and was discovered in the tomb of. I mean, very well could have been possessed, but, uh, as we've apparently already established earlier in the video that, uh, demonic possessions are not real. So I don't know why they're bringing that up. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's, um, oh, that's fun. I, uh, the most dangerous book of spells in human. I, uh, accidentally put Derek's, uh, Derek's stream on here because I accidentally hit the next button. Uh, anyway, uh, if y'all get a chance, go, go subscribe to A Dose of Theosis with Derek Cummins. Anyway, in history, the name of the book is Le Grand Grimoire, and it was written around 1520. The author of this frightening book was an apocryphal figure named Honoris of Thebes. Many believe that the man was possessed yeah, by yeah, Satan. Yeah. The book is written in biblical Hebrew or Aramaic and was discovered in the tomb of King Solomon in 1750. According to legend, this book is also called The Red Dragon. It's one of the most. Okay, so the Tomb of Solomon in 1750 is like, I don't know like if the Tomb of Solomon is like still uh, still exists, but it's also one of those things of like, if it was written in Aramaic, which if I remember correctly, like Aramaic is like heavily Greek-influenced Hebrew, why would it have been in Solomon's tomb? I mean, other than like, somebody writing it at a much later date and you know placing it there i i suppose that would be possible but like I, yeah i don't know all of this sounds like i'm gonna like just make a bunch of stuff up that sounds cool and maybe it might reach the same amount of success that dan brown enjoyed one of the most powerful occult books in the entire world and there are even instructions on how to craft magical talismans amulets ways to conjure spells that will make you win lotteries and also many ways to communicate with the spirits of the dead and demons but the most terrifying spell in this historic book is the method to summon lucifer himself there are instructions on how you can make a deal with him there are many copies of the nefarious book out there but experts think that these are either fake or yeah so it's just like this is like oh vatican wants to keep a secret but there's many there's many copies out there uh, okay all right modified so the spells in them do not work but the believers think even these versions or uh, who was it, uh, St. Augustine, that was saying that like witches don't need to be feared because their powers don't exist? And it's just like, oh, these are obviously fake because these spells don't work. Okay, maybe it's because like you're, you're if if, or, if you follow like the witchcraft, maybe it's because your gods are fake and they don't have any power. So you know, maybe maybe that's it too. And it's not just because the Vatican's keeping the real one secret. Because I can almost promise you, if the Vatican did have access to this book. You cannot tell me that like it just wouldn't have been destroyed. Like if this is the only copy of this book, why would you keep it in existence? Like what possible good could that serve? Because the only thing that could possibly happen is like it's like if you had like a fully armed nuke in your basement, you you, you know, maybe you'd try to get rid of it, maybe try to disarm it, not just wait for it to like go off one day. Uh, and I feel like this book, if it's if it's got all these powers that they claim it to have, why why keep it around? These versions have some sort of power and influence. The original manuscript, however, owned by the Catholic Church, and besides them, no one knows its whereabouts. Number seven, Vatty leaks. Okay, yeah. So uh, that just like the one final note on that is just like, oh, that it's uh, the uh, the church has the original one. Says who? Like, uh, uh, what what evidence are you basing on this on? So it's just, yeah, whatever. Also called the Vatican leaks, this scandal would take the world by storm. It's almost like WikiLeaks, but for the greatest church in the world. Back in 2012, many documents exposing some terrible accounts of corruption in the Vatican would be leaked to the public. It all began with a television show called The Untouchables. This was followed by a book titled His Holiness, The Secret Papers of Benedict XVI. It was written by a man who exposed some pretty controversial and confidential information. These were memos and letters between Pope Benedict and his personal secretary. A lot would be brought to light about the finances of the Pope and the bribes that were taken by the Vatican from people who wanted an audience with him. An extensive corruption scheme was also unraveled in the letters from Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigiano. It was found that the... Vigiano. Yeah. Um... Yeah, like I said, the pronunciations get worse. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you know, this happened. I, I'll i be honest, like, I don't follow too much, like, all the inner, in, in, in going, and the, 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 all the actions of every single cardinal, every single bishop, uh, quite frankly, because um, corruption in the highest levels of the church is not a new thing. 
Uh, I think that it's actually very important that corruption in church leadership was noted in scripture. Um, and so, you know, for every, every 11 saints that you get that are among the apostles, you're going to get one Judas. So, uh, you know, and we've got a lot more than 11 bishops now. So, you know, um, just, I guess that level of corruption doesn't actually bother me because that's just human sinfulness and this side of eternity, we're just not going to get rid of it. That doesn't mean that like we shouldn't like these men shouldn't be held accountable and whatnot, but it's, it's something that it's not realistic to expect that it's going to be completely rooted out and we're going to bring paradise here on earth. Um, that, yeah, no, it's, but you know, these men will be held accountable, you know, on this side of eternity and the next, you know? Uh, so yeah, but anyway, and that's that's not to like swallow a black pill or anything. If anything, that's a pray for our leaders, pray for our bishops, pray for our pre priests, pray for the Pope, because uh, these are the men who are what they need it the most. They're in the positions that can do the most damage. So, uh, but, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Yes, they're in the position to do the most damage, but they're also in the positions to do some of the most good as well. Uh, so that's why it's super important to pray for our leaders, our church leaders. ...that the Holy See had lost millions of dollars in inflated contract prices. These documents exposed the power struggles in the Vatican, and the city turned out to be a hotspot of envy, political scheming, and factional fighting. There was also a document that would reveal... And from what I understand, too, like, in church history, like, you you, you read about, like, the Borgias and the Medicis and stuff like that. Like, n none of that is new. Like, this is, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So this isn't, like, this is a problem that crept into the church, like, in the past 20 years or something like that. No reveal that Cardinal Paolo Romeo predicted that the Pope would be dead within 12 hours. Besides the financial discrepancies and the professional enmity, these... <laughs> How wrong that prediction was. Vatican leaks also uncovered a scandal involving the homosexual clergy members. They were apparently being blackmailed by outsiders. The main reason why these leaked documents caused such a frenzy was that the information in them was actually pretty accurate. Though Pope Benedict refuted these claims and called them exaggerated rumors, an urgent meeting of all the high officials of the Vatican would be called, and after a few months of investigation, two Vatican aides were found guilty of leaking it out. One of them was Paolo Gabriel, the personal butler of Pope Benedict, while the other was a computer specialist at the Secretariat of State. The damage that these two men caused to the reputation of the Vatican was monumental. Oh, yes. Sorry. St. Francis Borgia. Um, fun fact. So St. Francis Borgia has a, uh, obviously, St. Francis Borgia. So, like, uh, I, I it, Father John, you might, uh, you would know better than me, but I believe, like, he was, like, even a, uh, like, a nephew of Pope Alexander VI, um, uh, who was uh, who was a Borgia? I, I can't remember. I think he's like Rodrigo Borgia or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but fun fact about Saint Francis Borgia because he became a priest uh, after his wife had died. So he actually, so he was a nobleman. His wife died. He had children, but like I, I guess his children were grown. So he actually entered the priesthood. Um, and uh, so you know, this saint has descendants, and because he was a noble, like these descendants have been tracked. So there is a current like F1 racing driver who is a who is a descendant of St. Francis Borgia. And I just thought that was kind of cool. And now that I've made that claim, it's like, oh, cool. Which driver? I don't know. I was on a Wikipedia binge and I was just like issue, you know, and just going down the line just to see if I could find somebody that was alive today. So but anyway, yeah, that's uh, that's a little fun little tidbit about uh, St. Francis Borgia. But despite that, the Pope did pardon them. Number eight, Vatican obelisk was stolen. Who doesn't know about... Okay, so I... He's about to say, oh, who doesn't know about the Vatican obelisk? It's like, well, I mean, it's there, but like, I can't say that I've ever like particularly given any special attention to it. Mostly because, just take a look at there. You've got the stone stick in the middle and you've got all this beautiful architecture with beautiful statues. And then just inside this, you know, St. Peter's Basilica, you've got some of the greatest art that's ever been committed or ever been committed, ever been uh, created in all of human history. So, yeah, like the stone thing in the middle. In, in you know, you put that in my front yard and sure, it's going to be the most impressive thing there. You put that in there and it's one of the least impressive things there. So, yeah. Anyway know about the giant obelisk standing erect in the center of St. Peter's Square. If you take a closer look at it, it looks exactly like the ones that are found in Egypt. Well, this one is also Egyptian, and it was stolen from Egypt by the ancient Romans. It's quite ironic that they displayed a stone. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, a uh, yeah, it was stolen. Well, I don't know if you can really say stolen, stolen because, you know, it was in Alexandria, which was part of the Roman Empire, and it was moved by the Roman Emperor. So if the Roman Emperor is moving the things that are in his empire, still within his empire, 
can you really call that stolen? So anyway, yeah, you can thank uh, Caligula for that one. Uh, no, it wasn't Caligula that, that actually stole it, but it was Caligula that moved it. Uh, anyway, whatever. I don't, I'm not too up on my Roman emperor history. Like I could probably find somebody that would know better. Anyway. They had a stolen obelisk in the very center of the Vatican. This one is around 4,500 years old, meaning that it's 1,500 years older than the city of Rome. It's also called Caligula's obelisk as Caligula took it from Alexandria back in 37 AD. I think that that's inaccurate, uh, but whatever. Okay. So it was just like, oh yeah. What about, uh, it was like, why would they put this pagan symbol in there? It's just like, okay, yeah. You know, what's on top of it. A cross. So, um, I can't remember what, uh, room it is, but I remember whenever I was back in the Vatican in like 2008, there's a painting up on a ceiling and there's like a statue of like Zeus or some Roman God, whatever. And it's pushed down and it's on, it's in pieces on the floor and standing in its place is the cross. So the fact is, is that, you know, Egypt played a pretty, pretty, uh, important part in salvation history. You know, that's where, uh, the Israelites were, you know, the Hebrews were enslaved. So the fact that like that obelisk, which came from Egypt is now at the seat of God's people and it's got a cross on top of it. It's, it's a, it's a giant sign of the cross is victorious over the slavery of Egypt. And it's a great reminder. It's a visual reminder. So that is something that is like, yeah, that's why it's there. Not because it's just like, oh, we're pagan nonsense, whatever. No, it's 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 a testament, it's a visual testament to the victory of the cross. AD. He wanted to place it in the Circus Caligula, also known as the Circus of Nero, where chariot races and many executions took place. This is where the first poor Saint Peter would be crucified upside down in 64 AD. The obelisk was later moved to its current location, and it's the only one that's still standing since the ancient Roman times. A lot is not known about the obelisk, but experts don't even know which pharaoh even ordered its construction. Yep. Many have stated that it's quite unsettling that a stolen relic has been made a signature monument in the city of Christianity. Num stolen relic. Like I said, like, stolen? Like, I mean, listen, like, people don't understand, like, how the ancient world worked. Like, do you know how soldiers, like, okay, so, like, I, I was in the military. How was I paid? Uh, you know, the government paid me out of taxpayer dollars. Uh, cool. That wasn't always the case, though. Like, it was just like, okay, if you were a soldier in the army, how were you paid? You were paid with loot. Like, you you were paid in the treasures that, like, you took from the city that you sacked. And that's just kind of how it works. Uh, the Roman Empire, you know, that's exactly what they did, too, whenever they conquered things. And why wouldn't they? That's literally what everybody did. So, like... Yeah, so, okay, so it was stolen by the Romans from the Romans. Um, and then uh, and then it's just like, okay, then Christianity came in and conquered, you know? And so, like, why, like, it's not stolen. It was conquered. So, which, that's something that, like, a, a lot of modern people uh, don't understand of just how that, yeah, anyway. Number nine, Jesus was married. It's no secret that the world... Oh boy, we oh we are absolutely riding on Dan Brown's coattails. Let's go. ...knows a lot about the death of Jesus, but there's hardly any information about his life. For a few decades now, there have been rumors that he lived his life like any ordinary man. There's allegedly textual evidence proving that Jesus was actually married to Mary Magdalene. This manuscript is from the 6th century and was originally written in ancient Syriac, but then translated into Greek. While the translation was underway, the story of Jesus Christ marrying Mary Magdalene would be discovered. This hasn't been mentioned in the Bible, but... Okay, well, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let him finish up here and then I'll, I'll, I'll spew my thoughts. There are detailed accounts about his birth and death, but very little known is about the 30 years that he was alive. The manuscript is called The Lost Gospel, and it portrays Jesus as a normal person who fell in love, married Mary Magdalene, and had children with her. This was not taken lightly by the church, as it's quite a controversial find, but many things... I mean, controversial is just like, or explicitly blasphemous and heretical. I think that the manuscript is not a reliable source. It is a real... And, like, explicitly, like, blasphemous and heretical, that does mean that it's not exactly controversial. It's just like, it's just bad. Like, it's... It's like you could say that Hitler was a was a was a controversial character. It's like, no, he's not very controversial. It's just like it's pretty widely agreed upon that like like what he did was evil. It is a real book from the British Library, but no one knows where it came from, when it was written. Oh, it's a real book from the British Library. Well, that's that's all we really needed to know. Or who even wrote it? The lost Okay, cool. There he said. They don't even know who wrote it. Okay. So it came from the sixth century. We don't know who wrote it. Okay. That makes it fan fiction, okay? It, it, it's just, 
you know, we see this today too. Like there's this popular work. Uh, it's just like, oh, this would be cool if these two characters were in a relationship or whatever. Okay, yeah, fine. That's whatever. It's not canon. It's fan fiction. So this quote unquote lost gospel, which is from centuries later, it, it, it why would you take this seriously? And then, uh, and then, you know, uh, I'll use the dirty word here of textual criticism. Like it's, uh, oh my goodness, the, the. I, I lost my train of thought because it's just so mind-bogglingly just silly to think that this is real. Oh, but yeah, textual criticism, like it, it reads like poorly written fan fiction. So. Of course we're not taking it seriously. It's an obvious fake. And what do we do? Like, it's just kind of like if, uh, you know, your 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 teacher sends you home with a note uh, that says, hey, uh, you were messing up here. I would need you to take this home to your parents and I need you to bring this back with their signature. And it comes back poorly written and in green crayon. Well, you know, like I, it, if there's some heavy evidence here that says like this is a forgery, this is a fake. Uh, I don't think that what, Reportedly, yeah, reportedly happened actually did happen so yeah and, and that's you know the the quote-unquote lost gospel might as well be written in green crayon lost gospel also says that mary magdalene was the daughter of god and a co-redeemer of humanity the manuscript emphasized yeah which doesn't jive with literally like any of the rest of scripture so that she may have been equally important as jesus but that surely is an unacceptable insight for the vatican and they've worked really hard to present like it's an unacceptable insight it, it's just like you know, if I take my kid's macaroni art to the Pope saying like, well, uh, my, my son says that Judas is actually the good guy. And then, you know, the Vatican guard, like, you know, the Swiss guard are like shortly thereafter, like dragging me out of there by my collar. Like, I would say that that's a justified thing. It's just like, get out of here. Shut up. This is like, like nobody should be taking this seriously. And, you know, it's only pushed by like silly conspiracy theorists like this. And it's just like, I don't even think that they believe what they're saying. Like, I think it's literally just for the clicks. Present Jesus as a powerful almighty God. Number 10. Okay. Yeah. So it's just like, oh, the, the church has worked hard of like trying to present Jesus as this mighty, all powerful God. And it's just like, well, I mean, that was, it, it's almost like saying like, you know, scientists have been trying really hard to present gravity as the thing that's actually holding us when we really know it's a bunch of tiny invisible lizards that are physically holding us down and, 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 and yeah, it's just like, okay. Um, well, what that, that, that is, that's not a threat. That's just a silly statement that has, it's completely baseless. And, you know, it's just like, it's not that we're trying to present gravity as like, you know, the dominant theory. It's just, that's just how it is. So, yeah, yeah. And the secret court. The Catholic justice system has a mind of its own. Certain crimes are deemed extremely bad by the Vatican. And to investigate these crimes, they have a... Okay, it's also a sovereign nation. So, like, like it's like, oh, the Vatican has a secret court. Uh, uh, okay. I, I imagine mo most countries would 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 have a would have a court system i i don't understand why the vatican would be different especially when the vatican has one point or you know vatican head of the church has 1.3 billion members so yeah occasionally there's going to be a need for a court system i don't think you can get a group of people that like get a group of people that large and not need something for like litigation and and, and whatnot like that that just seems like it's like criticizing them for having like a plumbing system. You know, it's just like, yeah, of, of, of course that's there. It's just what, it's just what you need after a certain point. Like, so yeah, whatever. They have a special court. This elite squad of bishops tries the people accused of these heinous crimes. As opposed to the mediocre squad of bishops. And the panel is called the Apostolic Penitentiary or the Tribunal of Conscience. It was founded by Pope Alexander III back in 1179, but up until 2009, no one even knew the court existed. The so nobody knew that this court existed except everybody. Nobody shuts up about the Inquisition. So it's just like, you know, the Inquisition was also like, it's like a court system. So it's just like, well, up until 2009, nobody knew that this existed. It's like, I guess not even the people that, you know, work there. So yeah, whatever. The tribunal hears cases about sins that are so terrible that only the Pope can pardon the perpetrators. Regular priests can deal with crimes like genocide. So this means that crimes that go before the regular priests can deal with things like genocide. Is there a is there an instance of like a genocidal person going to a priest to confess? Because, you know, I suppose genocide would would fall under 
murder and you know i don't i don't know i'm not a priest so i've never i've never been in i've never heard somebody confess murder before so i don't yeah uh but yeah no there are some sins that are uh so heinous that like yeah you have to go uh to the pope or to uh to one of the pope's uh delegated authorities uh to receive uh absolution for that and he's actually going to mention uh one of them here which i think is uh, is like hey actually you got something right good job for the pope must be even worse well, not necessarily, though. The crimes that can lead you to be tried by the apostolic penitentiary include trying to assassinate the pope. Expose yeah, that's pretty bad. Losing the identity or the sin of someone who confessed. Priest. Yeah, okay. That's that's pretty bad. You're breaking you're breaking the seal of confession. Uh, so, yeah, and it's just like church pretty, you know, if you do that, that's under pain of excommunication. You got to go to the pope to get rectified for that one. It's engaging in sexual activity, abortions, and more. Strangely, spitting out a communion wafer is also considered an act worthy of trial by this tribunal. The pope act Correct. Okay. So if you don't understand what communion is, then I would understand why you would think that that's, uh, that would be, uh, why that's just not, not a big deal. But whenever it's just like, okay, we believe that the Eucharist is God. Like that is, that is the body of God. And if you spit it out, that is just going to want to be one of like, that is the most heinous act that you could, you could, uh, commit because it's just, it's a, it's, one of the highest forms of disrespect that you can give to our Lord. And, you know, it's like, if it's an accident, okay, well then, you know, that's, that's a different story. Uh, like, let's say you receive communion and you sneeze or something like that, something awful like that. But, um, you know, it was, it was an accident. It was involuntary, but whenever it comes to, uh, like if you spit it out, yeah, you're going to have to, you're going to have to go to, uh, you know, to the apostolic see to get rectified on that. Now, I don't know if like, if you do that, it, I, I don't know, it probably depends on the case, whatever, but it's just like, I imagine it would be more like a, you could do that remotely or, or whatever, or maybe, you know, the crime is bad enough to where it, it's like, yeah, pack up your suits and get to Rome because uh, you're not getting absolved for this uh, until you, you get to Rome. But you know, the church is typically uh, really big on mercy. So it's just like, well, I, I, I want, I, I want to be reconciled, but um, I, I I just can't afford the trip. You know, then I'm sure like, okay, we'll work something out. Just, you know, you need to show the the proper dispositions and and you know, it's like, <laughs> you need to have a firm resolution to never do this again. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Pope acts as the head of the panel and he's the only one who can grant absolution. The case is in this court. Well, okay, so he can authorize the ab absolution. Uh, I think there's a... There's this uh, on the Catholic podcast, the the Catholic talk show, whatever, with the oh geez, I can't remember the name of the priest that's on that uh, podcast. The uh, anyway, Pope Francis actually delegated that priest as like a missionary of mercy, so like he actually does have the authority to forgive sins that would normally be reserved uh, by the Pope. So he might need to uh, 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 you know. He'd, he'd go to, to father rich there we go father rich pagano um and say like hey you know this is this is what's up and like you know father rich may need to make some phone calls or whatever but like he would have that authority but anyway this court are heard privately under fake credentials to protect the identity of the accused and because the church believes it's a matter of conscience no one knows what kind of crimes or criminals have been before this tribunal and whether or not they were punished or pardoned number well okay well okay so first off what kind of punishment would the church offer uh because <laughs> You know, because some people are some liberal snowflakes, whatever. We can't execute people anymore, or whatever. No, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, it's just like I imagine most of them like would be pardoned. But like, thank God that they're not public because I imagine that the, the issues that they're dealing with there, if they were made public, you know, people wouldn't. That would be an obstacle of like, well, I'm not going to do this because it's going to that would ruin me if everybody knew that I came here for this. So same thing with confession. It's just like, well, you know, if I if I confess this heinous crime to this priest, all he's going to do is just rat me out to the police. Therefore, I'm not going to confess it. And, you know, and then that puts your soul in danger. So I would see like why this tribunal would be private just for that exact same reason. Anyway, number 11 transcripts from Knights of Templar. Among the I feel like the night, the night, the Knights of Templar or the Knights Templar, you mean? Anyway, um, I feel like this is just one of those things of like, if you, it, it's, you could say that it's the Knights Templar, the Freemasons, uh, you, you know, Illuminati, whatever. It's just, these are, these are like conspiracy theory buzzwords that it's just like, if 
to a certain set of people, you throw these words in there, that gives you credibility. To reasonable people, you see these things there, and your suspicion meter like immediately goes through the roof. Among the secret documents held in the Vatican's archives, there's a yellowed parchment with a neat black script that bears answers to many questions asked by historians. Okay, so, oh, the researchers have been trying to get access to the Vatican secret archives. And meanwhile, he just described a document in the Vatican secret archives. So which is it? Can you not get in there? Or can you get in there and you can read this document? Historians, it is the official court documents that reveal the details of the infamous 14th century trials of the Knights of Templar on the suspicions of heresy. This order of Christian warriors traces its beginnings to the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem when nine knights were given the task of protecting pilgrims on the roads of Jerusalem under the auspices of King Baldwin II and the Patriarch Wormut. The order of the warriors was persecuted by King Philip IV of France, who was suspicious of their growing wealth and influence. Pope Clement was the one to... Oh, okay. I, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I'm all kind of on the fence of, like, I don't believe you, and sure, why not? So, okay. ...to initiate an investigation, sending out many knights to trial. Some would be eventually pardoned by the Pope, and the full name of the order was Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon. Now, the knights had become an elite fighting force in the Crusades and were known for their propensity not to retreat or surrender. It was their rules of secrecy, their privilege, power, and wealth that all led to the king accusing them. This eventually led to their destruction. The temple. So, or maybe they were actually guilty of the things that they were accused of. I, I, I wasn't there. I, I, I know, like, especially some of you Zoomers might think that I'm, I'm pretty old, but believe it or not, I'm not, I'm not actually this old. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's whatever. I wasn't there, but like, just to say like, oh, he only did this because of this. Well, I mean, were you there? Because like, or did, did this king confide in you? Did he tell you this? I, you don't look that old, uh, mostly because you're breathing. So like, I don't know. It, this is all just hogwash nonsense. The Templar leader, Master Jacques de Malo, was arrested on charge of heresy in 1307. And in France, many of these knights, along with their leader, were burned at the stake, while others were sentenced to perpetual imprisonment. Sim okay, so that's another thing of, like, church executions, like, being burned at the stake. You know, we, uh, uh, okay, so Father John says that they probably weren't guilty. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but this all goes back to, like, that point that we were saying, um, uh, you know, they're, have been corrupt individuals in the church in the past, centuries ago, all the way up to present day. Yep, that that kind of comes to the territory when you get a large group of people together and you have power. So, like, you know, fallen people are going to desire power. It's That's just how it is. Like, and I don't care if it's it's the church or any other corporation, whatever, it doesn't matter. The moment you get large group of people and power involved, People are going to want it for fallen means. Or fallen purposes, whatever. Anyway. Similar trials would be held in many different places after France, which included England, Scotland, Ireland, Germany, Spain, and Cyprus. But their outcomes were a little less horrifying. Number 12, child abuse. The Catholic Church has been bombarded. Oh, I bet none of us have ever heard this one before because the Vatican's been so good at keeping it secret. Bombarded with thousands of sexual abuse allegations in the past few years. From towns in the Australian countryside to schools in Ireland and multiple cities in America and Canada, allegations of heinous crimes have been pooling in against the clergy members. The allegations first surfaced in the United States in 1980s, but the worst cases were reported from Ireland and Austria in the 1990s. Back then, the church had no policy to protect and ensure the well-being of children. No one was even required to report crimes against children to the church. The leaders have been issuing apologies for years now. The Boston Globe, a news... Yeah, I mean, right, rightfully so. Like, uh, you know, I, I've, I've done quite a bit of digging on this. Um, and I don't know if there were no... I, I mean, you know, whenever I was in 2002, whenever, like, the, the policies were actually implemented, you know, I was 10 and not even Catholic. So like, I don't know about the rules beforehand, but like, okay, sure. Let's say that there was nothing in place. Uh, sure. Like that was the case. It was a problem. It needed to be rectified. And like, actually like since then the Catholic church has done some of the best jobs at like protecting children. Now one case is too many. So there's still, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. But, like, it's not, like, the doom and gloom and, like, this is a Catholic-only problem. Like, once again, this is a fallen human problem. So if you have fallen humans in your organization, you're going to have problems like this. So. A newspaper from the United States would expose the child abuse and urge victims to speak up. Between the year 2000 and 2010, the U.S. diocese had to make... Okay. Just pay attention to, like, what they're using here. Like, it's dump Trump, impeach, like, whatever. It's... Yeah, okay, like, that's, what does this have to, like, I know you're just using B-roll and stock footage, but, like, come on now, like, this is, this has nothing to do with, with the church's, uh, 
sex abuse scandal. But yeah, so yeah, no, just anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Make numerous settlements with abuse victims. In 1995, the Archbishop of Vienna had to step down because of these allegations. The newspaper also revealed that instead of holding the accused perpetrators accountable, the church began moving them around. A church commissioned report. Yeah, and uh, that, that there was many such cases of a uh, like of, if a bishop was made known of it, uh, of, a, of a sex abuse, uh, sex uh, predator in his uh, in his diocese. Yeah, he would just move them around. Uh, but you got to think of like general culture of these times too, like pre nineteen eighties. Like sexual abuse just wasn't something that was talked about, and that's that's not an excuse because if anybody uh, had any reason to know better, it was the church. Uh, so like, that's certainly not an excuse, but like, there's some cultural understanding of like, yeah, um, it's, 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 it's bad that that happened, but you could see how any leader of any organization would have done a similar thing. It was wrong. And like, absolutely. Like we're, we're doing, uh, you know, we're doing, we're doing good work now to like help solve some of this i mean obviously some of these crimes like this this was really heinous about them's like there's no undoing them so um yeah so like it, every if anybody had a, had a reason to know better like if anybody knew better it was it was the catholic priest at the time so like there's 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 no excuse of ignorance there um but yeah and you know it, we can just pray for the victims do what we can um but it is something uh, it is something to do, uh, something to notice is that like every time, you know, in Illinois, some more cases have come to light, which, you know, a little bit, thank God for that. Uh, but like, they're all from like the 1970s, 1980s. Um, like it's good that they're being brought out. So that way these victims can get some semblance of justice. Um, but like, yeah. And, uh, anyway, I'm going to let him finish up a little bit. And then I, I wanted to bring up like at least one more point. A report issued in 2004 revealed that at least 4,000 priests had been accused of sexual misconduct in the past 50 years. They had abused tens of thousands of victims, most of whom would be young boys. Pope Francis promised in 2019 that the abusers would receive due punishment, and he even held an unprecedented summit on pedophilia in the church and changed the laws to criminalize sexual abuse. But that doesn't mean the cover-ups have stopped. A recent inquiry... Yeah, well, I mean, you know, fallen people, um, you know, it, it, it's sad. And that's why, like, once again, pray for our bishops, because, you know, if... It, I mean, even... Even if you were like selfish and just wanted to cover your own hide, you know, owning up to these kind of things as is like even in your own selfish self-interest, owning up to it is the right way to go about it. Uh, it gets justice for the victim. And like, it's just, you know, it's just in, it's upholding your own integrity. Like, I mean, come on, like I, I shouldn't have to explain that to literally anybody. Query has revealed that about 216,000 children in France have suffered abuse at the hand of clergy members since the 1950s. Most people think that the Vatican's stance against the abuse of children is merely a stance, and the sacred city has failed to take any solid action against the criminal. Okay, so, like, okay, once again, it's just like, okay, what are what are the uh, actions that the church can take against these perpetrators? It's like, okay, well, lay a cessation. Okay, cool. Um, you know, in the case of uh, McCarrick, like, he's been assigned to, like, a monastery. So he he effectively is in prison, but he's he's laicized um, and uh, and he's like confined to a monastery for the rest of his life. Like, okay, um, yeah. Oh wow. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and thank thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, don't Google public school children sexual abuse cases. Yeah, it's like he's actually he brings up a really good point. Like, I well, I don't want to say it's a good point because I don't want to downplay uh, the heinousness of like the the involvement of church leaders here. Cause it's just like, uh, I've, I've already stated it. Like if there was anybody who didn't have an excuse, it was the Catholic church. Uh, so it's like, so I don't like bringing that up because it just sounds like you're just downplaying the problem just by pointing at a bigger problem. But yeah, no, it is true though that like, yeah, public schools problems have a much bigger problem with sex abuse cases, uh, than the church does, especially in the past 20 years. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, I forgot. I, I had another point, uh, but um, anyway, I'll just keep going. The criminal clergy members. Number 13. Aliens. Okay. Whatever. So, um, you know, okay. So he's talking about like the uh, secrets that the Vatican doesn't want you to know. And he outlined all these things. It's just like, oh, and the church has done this to uh, to rectify this problem. Pope Francis called a summit. And, and it's just like, and you're reading public news articles about all this. And it's just like, dang, you know what? <sighs> If this is how the Vatican keeps secrets, 
Whew, man. Um, that is a, uh, that is a, uh, at that point you need to start calling into question the competence of the church leaders, because if this is how you're supposed to keep secrets, it's just like, dang, I'd, I'd hate to see how you try and make something public. Um, because I mean, I imagine that would like happen in the pound of like, or have heaven in the form of like a 500 pound bomb or something like that. So, but anyway, um, the, uh, after, so it, it, it's sad because like, I imagine these, uh, not all of these cases, especially here in the U S have been discovered yet. I, I imagine we are going to hear about more of them, um, until, uh, God forbid, you know, hopefully like the victims who are still alive, uh, can see some sort of justice in their life though. Uh, this sad part about it is, is that many of these perpetrators, like the cases are coming to light, they're being tried. Well, the problem is, is that the perpetrating priest is already dead. So it's just like, what can you do? Like, uh, it, it it's sad, but that's just the case. Uh, but, uh, I believe it was like in, uh, 20, yeah, it was, it was pre 28 or in 2018, whenever that wave of like, uh, cases that were coming about, uh, the archbishop of St. Louis, uh, did something that I thought was really cool. Uh, and that's, he called the attorney general's office. Uh, it was Josh Hawley at the time and said, I am inviting you and your office to come in and do an investigation you have access to everything, and I want you to root out every single case of sex abuse that you can find, and let's just bring it all out right now. And uh, the the office like uh, uh, accepted the invitation, uh, did an investigation, and sure enough, they found more. And you know, like that, I think that that was such a good move on the archbishop because one, justice can be delivered more swiftly, so that way it gives a greater chance for the victims to just get at least a little bit of justice, a little bit of closure. Like I said, there's no, there's no undoing the crime that happened to them, but like, it's just like at least we can give you this much back. Um, and then two, it's just like, let's just bring it all out now. Like we, we know that they're in the, it's hiding in the darkness. Let's, let's bring this snake out into the light and crush it. So yeah. But anyway, like I really appreciate, I can't remember if that was Archbishop Rosansky or uh, I think it was Archbishop Carlson at the time, uh, who has since retired. So, but anyway, Archbishop Emeritus Carlson. So, but, uh, but yeah, that, that was something that I thought was really cool. Um, I know Haley's, uh, not in here right now, but, uh, yeah, number 13 aliens, the Vatican is hiding aliens. Yes. Back in the 17th century, some documents from the Vatican library were closed to outsiders under the order of Pope Paul V. It wasn't. Okay. So once again, like, are these, are, are these archives secret or are they, um, or are they available to the public? I, 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 I don't know. Until 1881, that researchers gained access to these again. And among all the speculations was a thing. Oh, okay. So 1881 was whenever it was opened up again. Okay, sure. I, sure. I don't know off the top of my head if that's wrong or not. It rumored that these documents might hold evidence of extraterrestrial life. And it's in might hold evidence of, of, of extraterrestrial life. It's amazing what you can get away with, uh, you know, when it's just like, hey, guys, I might be sitting on a million dollars right now. I mean, you know, probably not, but it's, but it's possible. And, you know, there's, there's endless possibilities with might. So, yeah. And it's interaction with the church, a Russian professor allegedly gained access to the archives and the documents contained nearly 12. Oh, allegedly this Russian professor allegedly get, I mean, oh man, with the power of allegedly, we're going to the moon fellas. Over centuries worth of Europe's history. While he was checking them out, he came across some things that looked kind of fishy. There were papers that described aliens and how they had influenced and interacted with ancient civilizations. The papers also revealed that almost all civilizations have had their fair share of contact with extraterrestrials, especially the Egyptians and the Mayans. The professor also claimed that he found records of incredibly powerful weaponry that was used by the ancient people. One text supposedly revealed that the walls of Babylon were melted using a weapon that emanated unbelievable amounts of heat and energy. Almost okay, so like I mentioned toward the beginning of the show, these are like... You just have to fill out a form and ask for access to the apostolic records, like it, it, the apostolic archives. Like that's all you have to do. You know, 60 researchers are allowed in every day. So you just fill out a form and ask. So if all of this is true, it would be verifiable. You just got to go at maybe it'll take you a few times because it's big and you don't know exactly where to go or whatever. Maybe maybe find somebody who's been there a few times before and just ask him for directions. I don't know. But it's just like all this speculation is dumb because it's just like, 
why do why are we speculating about this because like you can just go so like or maybe find a researcher in rome that you can pay to go research this for you it's like hey i got a project for you i'll pay you this much to go into the archives and and find out about all the aliens and you know what i'll i'll, I'll pay you double if you can bring out an actual alien almost like the modern nuclear bomb while these are just claims and the professor never managed to provide any evidence these are just claims and we have no evidence but yet we're still going to flap our jaw about it but it's it is exciting to assume that our ancestors may have been in contact with aliens it's exciting to assume like it's exciting to assume that just on the other side of this door my little curtain here elon musk is waiting to uh give me 10 billion dollars i'm just going to assume it we're not it's just it's, we're not going to verify it and, and you know i I'm not, if it's not true, I'm not going to tell you guys about it. But uh, man, it, it's kind of a, it's it's quite the exciting prospect, huh? I, I, I just, whatever. The Vatican, however, will never reveal whether or not these records do exist. Or you can just go in and verify it for yourself. Number 14, Pope Joan. Oh, this is one of my favorite ones. The stories of a female pope have been around for quite a while now, but no one can say for sure whether these are accurate or not. Pope Joan was a woman who allegedly ruled... Nobody could say for sure whether she was real or not. Like, mm, okay, I'm pretty sure that she was not. And I'll get into the reasons here. Uh, go ahead and start paying attention to the years that they claim that her papacy was. Vatican as a pope for a few years during the Middle Ages. She would become famous in the 13th century when her tales spread throughout the continent. For many centuries, it was believed to be true, but the scholars now think that the story was actually fake. Pope Joan has been described. Okay, so the years that were cited were a few years in the middle ages nope just no nope, no other like okay nope no from this year to this year um like that that that's just like okay cool that was and then you know it was in the 13th century when the stories started popping up uh, okay all right so you couldn't give me a year now here's what makes me perfectly confident that she was never a pope um and that was and that's the fact that uh, all the popes are accounted for. Like, with exceptions of, like, a few years of, like, the seat being vacant because, you know, the previous pope had died or, you know, resigned or whatever, and the next pope hadn't uh, been elected yet. With the exception of those times, like, the, they're, they're, the popes are accounted for. Now, there were a few instances of times where you had a pope and an anti-pope, but whatever. But, like, what? Like, where, where could she have fit in in this story because the documents are pretty pretty solid you know like uh my buddy kevin has has talked about uh you know like he he, he calls into questions like oh what about the sixth pope who was named sixtus which means six you know it's just like okay well maybe his real name wasn't recorded because you know he that that just privacy sake whatever his persecution makes sense and um yeah. So, but anyway, it's just like wh when would Pope Joan have been a pope? So, ugh. described as an incredibly talented woman who entered the church by disguising herself as a man. Because she was smart, Pope Joan rose amongst the ranks quite rapidly and then was soon declared the pope. No one knew that she was a woman until one day she ended up in labor during a procession and she So nobody knew that she was a woman and yet but she was in labor. So I guess like her her lover didn't know that she was a woman. Huh. Okay. Also, like at the same time of like, if you were crafty enough uh, to uh, make your way to the papacy uh, to, uh, you know, to get go. Okay. So you, you were crafty enough to do that. However, you weren't crafty enough to like control yourself and not fornicate. So, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. That, Totally checks out. This doesn't sound made up at all. She reportedly died after the delivery. So far, historians do not know whether or not she was killed or just died of natural causes. And the church processions began avoiding the spot. Where I, I think it's a different option is that she never existed in the first place. Where she gave birth and eventually the Vatican removed her from the official list of popes. And since she never existed in the first place, I mean, it's your fan fiction. So, I mean, you can kind of end it however you want to. They also established a ritual to ensure that whoever became pope in the future was definitely male. According to Martin... So there's a there's a crotch inspection like as part of becoming pope like that sounds made up and dumb because like I mean I remember watching a documentary about like Pope Francis's like becoming pope whatever and it's just like I don't remember that part. One of the coolest things I thought though was the weeping room is that um, 
you know, Pope Francis repeating the words of uh, Pope John Paul the uh, first, like upon being elected to the papacy, like he, like the first thing that he said was, uh, "My brothers, may God forgive you for what you've done to me." And you know, there's a weeping room where, like, the Pope, like upon being elected to the papacy, can go and just weep because it's just like, "Congratulations, you've now got the world on your shoulders." And you are responsible for that. And like, I don't know. Like, I would be, I, like, tears. I think are the is the appropriate uh, is the appropriate response to that because it's just like that is that is quite the responsibility. Um, so yeah. Anyway, Martin of Opava. Her real name was Joan Anglicus of Mainz, and she actually entered the church because of her Joan Anglicus. Paul, this was you. This is one of these Anglican women who snuck into the papacy. Uh, how dare you? Okay, now, so, anyway. Lover, but the 16th century Catholic and Protestant writers think that she was just a fictional character. Number 15, the chronovisor. So, notice that, uh, the, uh, like, even Protestant scholars are like, yeah, this sounds like total nonsense. So, it's just like, yeah, and it's just one of those things of, like, I wouldn't ever use the argument of Pope Joan didn't exist, therefore Catholicism true. Like, that's not an argument. Also, like Pope Joan did exist, Protestantism true. That doesn't follow either. So yeah, it would make sense that like Protestant scholars would also be like, yeah, this is nonsense. So yeah, anyway. Oh, the chronovisor. This is probably the most legitimate one. And uh out of all of them, um uh out of all of them, this is uh this is probably the one that's the most convincing. Visor. The chronovisor is a supposedly a device that gives its user the ability to see through time. Between the 1960s and 1990, Father Pellegrino Ernetti claimed that he assisted in the invention of a sort of time machine called the chronovisor. He reportedly used it to look back in time and see the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The existence of this time machine has not been proven so far, but in 2002, a book would be written by priest Father Francois... Okay, so I love how he's just like, oh yeah, the existence of this hasn't been proven, but the Vatican's trying to keep it a secret. Man, okay, you know what? Like, uh, here's a here's a challenge for y'all because we're almost at the end of this. Um, after the video is done, I want you to make up a secret that the Vatican is trying to keep from the world, and uh, whoever whoever comes up with the best one, I'll pin it to the top. So yeah, so try so for the rest of this, just try to think about um, uh, you know, your favorite, uh, you know, what secret the Vatican you think is keeping. So anyway, let's go. Uh, Brune who revealed quite a lot about it. According to the book, Father Ernetti was a Benedictine monk, and he allegedly kept the device a secret until the early 1960s. It was during the 60s that he confided in Brunet and told him how 12 scientists, including Enrico Fermi and Werner von Braun, who was a former Nazi, helped to build the game-changing machine. It's said to be made of cathode rays, antenna, and metals that received sound and light on almost all wavelengths. The chronovisor allowed the team of scientists to document events of the past, and they believed that this machine could help them to validate the teachings of the Bible. Brune wrote that Ernetti told him the device had several antenna, three of which were made of mysterious metals, and there was also a direction finder that tuned into the era that one wanted to see. A screen showed the desired event, while a recording device recorded the footage. It was more of a window into the past instead of a typical time machine. Ernetti recounted that he witnessed Marcus Tilius Cicero's speech to the Roman Senate in 63 BC, and besides that, he also saw the founding of the Roman Empire, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and many other biblical events. Until he died, Ernetti did maintain his stance on the existence of the chronovisor, and that it had been hidden away in the Vatican for safeguarding. The people who brought this device to the light are long dead, but the mystery that surrounds it still persists, as the Vatican is quite tight-lipped on the matter, and there hasn't been... Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah. The uh, let's just go ahead and end that there because okay, the chronovisor. Um, I can't remember which episode it is right off the top of my head, but like Jimmy Aiken, uh, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, he's actually got an episode talking about the chronovisor, which is, I mean, if you there's like okay, that's kind of neat, but like, my goodness, could you imagine, could you imagine how much, how, how much everything could be settled? With just like, okay, well, let's just go back in time and look at what happened. Like, if that were real, don't you think that, like, that would be the thing that we would be, like, exploiting? But, like, it, and also, like, what makes me, um, what makes me, like, more suspicious about the coronavirus too, is just, like, at all, all the events that they rattled off that, like, they saw, like, they were all, like, very significant events that, like, all of you were aware of. When in reality, if like you just started to look back in time, like you would probably just see an empty field. Or if you did see people, it'd probably just be like normal peasants, like buying cabbages or something. I don't know. Like it wouldn't be anything spectacular, but everything that they mentioned was spectacular. 
So it's just like, okay, well, we want to see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, okay, w w when did that happen? Like, down to the hour, when did that happen? And it's just like, I mean, was it like a VCR where you could just like hit fast forward, rewind, whatever, and just goes real quick and just hit play whenever it looks about right? I don't know. So, but anyway, uh, yeah, so that was that. So uh, those were the 15 deepest, darkest secrets that the Vatican's keeping. Let me know what you thought down in the comments. Like I said, uh, tell me what you, uh, what you think the Vatican's hiding. and uh, and past that that's all i got guys thanks for oh um last thing uh Haley Luya is doing uh the litany to the state uh litany to the sacred heart on her channel so after i shut down here i'm gonna head over there and i would recommend that you do the same so yeah just Haley Luya. like you've probably seen her everywhere so just uh h-a-l-l-e-y space l-u-j-a-h um uh, and uh, go do that but other than that that's all i've got have a good night